Welcome to Are You Real, episode 55 with Jamie Mailhot. Welcome to Are You Real? Finding the Authentic You, the podcast that focuses on Christians that are active in everyday life. Join in as we speak to everyone from successful business owners to educators to athletes about their faith and how it helps them reach out and revolutionize those around them to do the same. And now, get ready to roar with your host, the voice of manifestation, John Fuller. Hey, Roar Nation. I am super excited today. We are on a mission here at Are You Real to find people that are living out their purpose, that have passion, and that are making a difference in culture. And I have found just the guy for you today. But before we jump into that, I do want to say thank you for those of you that have gotten into iTunes. I ask you every week to rate and review us. And this last week, Judy Sullivan said, I found your podcast about a week ago and have already listened over half the episodes. That is incredible. Thank you for all your effort in finding inspirational guests to be on our show. I have been given so much revelation and creative thoughts into my own business ideas. All the resources shared has me on a reading backlog. You and me both, Judy. No kidding. Keep up the good work and God bless you and your family for all that you do. So Judy, thank you so much for leaving a five-star review. And listeners, if you would do that, it helps other people kind of get an idea of what our show's about and let them know that we are the real deal. So anyways, guys, let's do this. Jamie, are you ready, my friend? I'm super excited. Let's do it. All right. So, Jamie is a Christian author, a life coach, and a visionary. His passion and calling is to help Christians make the most of the lives that God has entrusted them with helping the body of Christ reach its full potential and connect more effectively. He is the author of Epic Christianity, which I cannot wait to hear about. He writes about a seven-day journey to discover your purpose. He is a husband and dad to his three kids and wife and continually keeping his commitment to follow God. God's plan for his life. All right, Jamie, I want to hear more about you, your book, and your passion for Jesus, my friend. Okay, well, I guess I'll start out basically telling you, you know, a little bit about where I started. You know, as a, I became a Christian at 16 years old, and it was kind of a different path than most people. I, I had gone to church with some friends and things like that, but I was on my way home. I was actually driving in the car, and I remember just crying so hard and just pulling over on the side of the road. And it was like God had just touched my heart. You know, I, I used to believe, you know, when you die, you die, and there was no God. But when God reaches down and touches your heart, you know, there's nothing that, that can impact you in that way. And I remember at that moment, just pulling off on the side of the road by myself, giving my heart to Christ and, and being appreciative for the forgiveness, you know, that, that comes, you know, through Christ. And, and immediately I started tr- striving to live my life for him and, and do the things that he wanted me to do. I immediately started confessing things to people that I had been lying about or, or been wrong about. And, you know, it was a true life change. And when I, you know, see Christians nowadays, you know, the way I approach people is I want to be the Jesus in their life. I want to be the message in their life. And, you know, I think that, you know, some sow, some water, some reap. I just want to be it. Some other people may pray the prayer with them, but I, I think if I, if I can show Christ and God can reach down and touch people, then I think that that's what brings real life change. So for me, you know, Christianity is built upon realness. It's built upon, you know, a real true relationship with God. And from that point, Going on, the most important verse in my life became Jeremiah twenty nine eleven, which is a, a life verse for a lot of people. Where you know God is, is talking, He says, "For I know the plans I have for you," declares the Lord, "plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future." And when I realized God had a plan for my life, it started changing everything. It wasn't just I'm saved now. It was if you have a plan for me, what is that plan? What is it that you want to accomplish? And I liked how Ephesians 2.10, it said, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God pre- prepared in advance for us to do. And I was like, okay, God, you have a plan for me. You're going to prosper me, not to harm me. And you have prepared things in advance for me. And of course, beyond that, we realize, you know, that we're gifted, you know, that we each, you know, have talents and things that we're entrusted with and that God wants to do. And it's it's been a life journey. It's been a journey to get there and find that plan. And, you know, I'll let you, we'll get into a little bit more of that in a little bit, but it became my passion to not only find my plan for what God wanted to accomplish in and through my life, but also to help others to find that plan and purpose for their lives. And that began kind of a, you know, a lifelong journey to where I am today. 
Okay, let's dive into that a little bit. We'll jump into your book, but obviously you wrote your book because it's the overflow of your heart and the path that you've taken. Take me a little bit about down that journey of finding your purpose, because I think a lot of listeners, that's a question all of us have at one point in our life. We want to know, hey, God, what did you create me for? What's my purpose? So what was that process for you starting that? Well, it was funny because, you know, I'd always had a good heart for God and, you know, but I'd struggle, you know, I would, I would fall short, you know, I was, I was 16 and I was 17 and, you know, while my heart was for God, I would just struggle. Life is just difficult. And I know I was real close to the pastor of the church that I was at and it was like, he saw something in me and it's almost like, uh, you know, you felt like he wanted you to say, Hey, you know, I'm going to work in full-time vocational ministry. And it was almost out of like, Hey, I'm not going to let anybody have power over my life. You know, I'm going to let God have it. It's almost like I'm like, there's no, I'm not going to say I'm called to ministry. But at some point there came a time where just in my heart, I felt like God said, you know what, you know, I'm going to use you. And I was, and I was like, I told myself, I was like, there's nothing else that I'd rather do than love God and serve him. Now, whether you call that vocational ministry or whatever, or wherever it may be, you know, I wanted to give my heart to Christ and I wanted to fully live my life serving others. And now that could be anywhere. And, and you talk about that along your show as well. You know, God calls us all to ministry and it's just a matter of, you know, where we're ministering and to minister is basically to be a representative of and to meet the needs of, you know, those are the actual definitions, you know, in the dictionary. And we're all called to meet others needs and be a representative of Christ. So that's where I finally said, you know, I'm fully committed to this. But the problem was, is, well, what does that look like? What is that going to be? And I think that that's where a lot of people start to wonder, like, hey, I'll serve God. I'll love God and I'll and I'll do, you know, what it is he wants me to do. Although we do have stipulations. But what does he want me to do is always the question. Exactly. So, you know, immediately, you know, I just started searching and I'd start working at the church and doing different things and became a youth pastor. My wife was pregnant with our twins at the time. I was only I think I just turned 21 years old. And I'm like, okay. Well, I've, I've got to do something. And, you know, I did have a heart for ministry. I did have a heart for people. So I became a, a full-time youth pastor. But it was funny, you know, I, when I first became that, I was so excited about becoming a youth pastor because I'm like, wow, like I'm making a living, you know, doing ministry and, and serving others and, and living life with others and encouraging others to follow Christ and, and making a difference in their lives. This is amazing. But during that time, I still felt discontented. I knew something else was there. I always had these dreams for bigger and, and more and, and greater reach and and it wasn't like, oh, I want to work at a big church. Jamie, real quick, I want to ask you this. Did you have, okay, because so you were young, you were 21. Did you go into it with a mindset because you didn't know what your purpose was? So you thought to serve God, I have to be in ministry. I had that mindset. So, and I think most people do. Did you as well? See, everybody tried to put that mindset on me. Okay. And I, it's like, I fought it as hard as I could. I'm like, Good. listen, I really believe I just couldn't explain it. I was like, he's going to do something different. It's not going to fall in those categories, but I just didn't know what it was. It's just so hard. And I, and I, I struggle with, you know, the education system, you know, asking fifth graders what they're going to do for a living. Cause I'm like, I really, these people really have no idea. And I don't want to push them <laughs> down a path. You know, it's like once they decide they're going to be a veterinarian, then that's everywhere they're going to go for the rest of their life when God may be calling them to something else. But it was that same idea. You know, it's like, you know, you have to decide. But God was gracious enough to me to not just have me go down that path and just be on that that treadmill or that path, you know, without finding, you know, my true purpose. Okay. All right. So where was I going? Just uh, on your life journey. So at this point, okay. you're you're a pastor, your wife, you're either yes. having twins or she's. Okay. So we've had the twins. We've had the twins now, but I'm still, still knowing God wants something else. So I really did a a personal journey, like, you know, really looking into myself and seeking God and, you know, doing spiritual gift tests and personality tests and a lot of personal growth and things like that. You know, and I realized, you know, my, my spiritual gifts were leadership, wisdom, and discernment. Well, that doesn't really narrow you down anywhere. What that means is, is that God can use you to to lead and to help and to do something. But where is that going to be? You know, and then I, I started figuring out what my strengths were and what my strengths weren't. You know, and I found that finding out what my strengths weren't was a big part, too, because you end up doing a lot of things that you're not gifted at, that you really hate and that you, you know, are just wasting time at. So I, I went through a, a personal journey like that. And I realized I said, God wants to lead me, you know, to use me to to bring change, to impact people, to create, you know, a, an organization or or a group of people or something that would make a difference, a positive difference for him. But then I, I couldn't figure out what the, the cause was going to be. Like, well, what, what is that going to be? What's it going to look like? And I kept praying that. And I, I got so desperate. I'm like, you know, I'm like, Jesus, if you were to come back and live one life, you know, what would you do with it? And then I basically said, I'm that life. 
I will be that one life. I will do anything that you want me to do. And, you know, it was a, it was a couple of weeks later, I had just laid down to bed and I was laying there and all of a sudden just within me, I just felt, you know, it's not audible, but I just felt God say, you know, I would come back and I would help my church connect and work together more effectively. And I had been, it had kind of, you know, opened my eyes to see how we as the body of Christ, you know, live and, and work and, and function so disconnected and how much there's so much division within the body of Christ. And we are all the body of Christ and all these differences and things like that. And since that point, you know, that was about 15 years ago. Since that point, I've seen how, you know, God has been working that all around the world, you know, and how denominations are coming down and how people are, are focusing on the things that unite us rather than the things that divide us. And it just built something in me. You know, at that point, I, I got up. I remember it was 105 in the morning and I had just finished writing a contract to God. You know, I was like, okay, I've got a vision now. God wants to use me to do something. I'm going to go do it. I wrote a contract with God and said, here's what I'm going to do. And, I, and I, I was inspired to do that by Bill Bright, who was the founder of Campus Crusade, which was oh, yeah. at, the, at the time the largest Christian organization in the world. I'm like, you know what? I want God to do something big through me. So I'm going to commit myself. And I wrote that out. I remember it was on one five oh five at one oh five in the morning, which makes it always easy to remember. So I wrote that out, and that was kind of the, the commitment. I, and I went to my to the pastor of the church there that I was working for, and I said, "Hey, you know, I feel like God's calling me to something." And at that point, I resigned. Now, was that the right decision? I'm not sure, but I resigned. I had enough money to live off for about three or four months, and at that point, four months. You know, right when I was running out of money, I started doing some internet marketing and trying to find a way to to make money to be able to make a living as I'm trying to build, you know, whatever ministry it is that God's calling me to build. And it was overnight, literally overnight, I replaced my income with the exact income I was making as a full-time youth pastor. And it was at the point where I came down to nothing and just like, God, you got to do something. And that that was like, okay, God, you're in this, you're doing this. And from that point on, you know, God continued to build me and grow me and it was like everything that I had ever done, even when I became a youth pastor, I said, you know what? God's called me a ministry. I was working as a, a video game tester just to, to make money at that point. I was working at a video game tester at EA Sports. Like everybody's like, you were doing that as like a job? I'm like, yeah. And I just quit. I, I said, God's called me in a ministry. The church I had, I had been at before, they lost their youth pastor. They were getting ready to do a summer camp. So I went and helped them do their summer camp for two weeks. At the end of those two weeks, I had nothing. And I had twin twin boys on the way. And everybody thought I was crazy. I'm like, they're like, are you putting resumes out? Are you making calls? All this kind of stuff. I said, no. I said, I just really feel that God's going to provide. He's going to lead in God. If he wants to put me somewhere, he's going to do it. And I don't know how I had so much faith at a young age, but on that last week at camp, I get a call from a pastor that says, hey, we heard about you. You know, we're looking for a full-time youth pastor. So the Monday after camp, you know, I go drive over there. It's about an hour away from, from where I lived. And, he, and I was basically hired on the spot. Wow. And it was like, God can do what he can do, you know, and, and if you have the faith and he's telling you to take step of faith, he'll do it. But where everything goes crazy is, is I had always been successful. I had always seen God come through when I had the faith to follow him and to trust him. But after, you know, trying to build up income and build enough for me to build the ministry that God wanted me to build and accomplish the things that God wanted me to accomplish, I felt like it's, things just started falling apart and I would work harder. And then they just continued to fall apart and I would work harder and harder and I'd seek God more and more. And, it, and everything was falling apart. I was going into debt. I was not able to keep up with things. You know, the, the car was repossessed. And I, I was just failing. I, I didn't know what to do. I just kept working hard. And I finally came to a realization. I'm like, I told my wife, I said, you know, I said, maybe God wants us to go through this, you know, because I don't know what else to do. And I, I didn't want it to be a cop out either. But when I came to the realization that, hey, maybe we need to go through losing everything to help us to be prepared to accomplish the works and the, and the plans and the purposes that he has for our life. At that point, it was the first time when I had been struggling for a couple of years where peace just came over me. I just continued to work, but we ended up losing it. We, you know, we got evicted from our house. We had, we lost everything we had. I was, we were using a borrowed car and I felt like the name that I had built for myself, the reputation I had built for myself of, of being a person who always was successful, who people would always come to for advice. I lost all that. And it hurt so bad. It was so much pain. And I remember, you know, having to go live with my in-laws. Jamie, I want to ask you that real quick. So you talk about it hurt, which I think it would hurt any of us. It would hurt myself. But do you think you had pride there? Do you think that was a pride issue? Possibly like looking hindsight? 
or no? You de- definitely look at hindsight. I think that all of us have a sense of pride. There's some good pride to have, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Just, yeah. And I think that there's some bad pride to have, but I think that there's at times when you can lose all that pride and it, in retrospect, when you look back on it and the way that God works, the more pride that you can lose and the more dependence you can gain upon God, the greater he can use you. And I sure, I, I believe that there there was probably some pride. Now, I'm telling you, you know, as humble as I can, I really strive to give God glory and, and love him and, and serve him and, and not carry my own pride. But being young, I'm, I know that there was, there was some there and it yeah, definitely. And, and, I don't, and I don't mean good pride. Good pride is obviously taking like, yeah, you're, you're happy about what you do or, you know, I take pride in my family, something like that. What, what I'm saying in that situation is more like I'm a good advice giver and, and God's bringing people to talk to me like that puffed up pride is what I'm talking about, because I yeah. think at a young age, a lot of us go through that. And that's OK. I mean, God does humble us and most of us have been severely humbled. <laughs> yeah, but, but that's what I'm talking about. Well. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you even bring that up because it helps me to look back and and gain even better perspective. Um, I don't believe that that was fully the thing. I think in general, I think that God wanted to bring me low in all areas. I think he wanted to just pull me down. And one great thing was, is you can you can see the goodness of God while he brought me down in worldly success and in finances and in total just failure as as a provider of my home and as, as the man I felt like that I should be. I don't think that my relationship with my wife and the relationship with my kids suffered. In fact, I think they got better and it's God's grace, how that works. And that's why I said in my bio, you know, one of my greatest accomplishments is, is, is I even put on my website, a world-class dad and husband. And I, then I put most of the time because that's been so important. It's the only thing I had left. So I didn't have anything else to build into except for those relationships. But that pain that was there, I remember, people didn't even want to necessarily even help me move because it was like they were, I had just lost so much and I, I it was really weird. I remember, <laughs> they were ashamed to help you move. I don't know. I, well, <laughs> I mean, that's I, funny, dude. I don't know. Well, no, I, at that point though, I had even borrowed from people cause I'm like, Hey, I'm not, I can't make it, you know? And it's like, you know, like my mom or, or, or my sister, you know, I, I hurt those relationships and that was, that was an additional pain, you know, so it wasn't just personal pain. I had hurt my relationships with people that were close to me. So it was almost like they were disappointed and, and hurt. And, you know, so I remember dropping the, the moving truck off about five miles from my house and just throwing my bike in the back of the truck and riding my bike home in the rain at about midnight with no energy, completely exhausted. It was the lowest point that I had gotten. And at that point, it was, okay, do I still keep trying to follow God or do I go find a way to plug into this world and make a living? I can't tell you how the difference of those things are, but sometimes we make a living and sometimes we fulfill our purpose and sometimes we do them both at the same time. But I felt like it was quitting. I felt like it was quitting. And I had always been successful at buying and reselling stuff and kind of making money on eBay and Amazon and things like that. And I said, you know what, if I put a little bit more effort into that and stop trying to spread my efforts so many ways, I think I can build myself back up. But I'm going to continue to work towards fulfilling my purpose. And over that, I I ended up being at at my in-laws house, I think for about eight months. And over that eight months, I remember right away, I fasted for five days. And then a month later, I fasted for 21 days. And then about three months later after that, I fasted for 40 days. And it was just, it was all I could do. It was like, okay, I can't make all this work, but what I can do is I can seek you, God, harder, and I can seek you better. And I calculated it up over that year. I think it was fasting like 25% of the whole entire year, and I'm not a faster. Like, it's just not what it was. But God had brought me down and humbled me so much that I didn't have anything else. But I want to ask you this. What did you feel like, what came out of fasting? Because sometimes people fast just to fast, but what was... What did you get out of it? What did you feel like See, spoke to you? I think when you go into fasting with the plan of getting something out of fasting, I don't even know that, that that's it, it, it's, it's always the right plan. I think for me, it was just desperation. It was, you know, you see, you see in the Bible many times, you know, they would pray and fast because there was famine or there, because their enemies were attacking them or something. They were desperate. They didn't have anything. So what else can they do to get God to help them? to show God that you're fully committed to him. And that was all I could do. That was the only thing else I could do. And so I I would read so much about fasting because one, I wanted to make sure I wasn't going to die from not having calories. (laughs) 
<laughs> you know, but just hearing people's stories. And it was so amazing. People that don't fast know everything about fasting. It's crazy. They're like, oh, yeah, no, God will show up to you amazing if you fast. I'm telling you, he'll he'll just show up. And I'm like, well, that's not actually true. But what what I felt was is I felt like all the flesh and all the everything that was in me just disappeared. All I had left was God. And it was like an open line with God. You know, God didn't show up in the flesh, but I remember just little things that would just show his presence, you know, and it was like, I felt like it was just an open line with God. And it was kind of like nothing was holding that back and nothing was separating that. And it's like, I just needed to keep going. I felt like God was saying, well done, you know, good and faithful servant, you know, just I just had to keep trusting him and keep moving forward. And, and I, and I know that God saw my heart and I, I write a whole entire chapter in the book called facing your desert. And it talks about, you know, how so many times, you know, when God brought Israel out of Egypt, he brought them through the Red Sea. He, he took them out of all of the captivity and all the pain and all that they were going through, but he brought them into a desert experience. They didn't have anything but God and manna. And then they still had their hearts from who they were. And it was during that desert experience where God had to really work on their hearts. They were only supposed to be there for a few months where God was going to to teach them and work on their hearts and prepare them to be his nation. But instead, their hearts were so far from him that they kept going back to their old ways of living. They kept grumbling and complaining. They started making other gods for themselves. And during that desert experience, you know, they ended up missing out on going into the promised land. You know, all the adult age people, except for Joshua and Caleb, didn't even get to enter the promised land. And I I feel like whenever you go through that desert time, you know, the Bible talks about it being a time of preparation, a time of testing. And how you make it through that time is going to determine what God ultimately does on the other side of it or even how long you spend in there. And I kept keeping that perspective. I remember I would write stuff down and I would basically say, you know, this time is a time of preparation. God wants to use this in my life and I'm going to become more committed to him. I'm going to you know, stay more focused on him. I'm, I'm going to pass the tests that come my way. I'm going to say no to the temptations that come my way. And I'm c- going to continue to pursue his purpose and plans in my life and be all that he has called me to be. You know, I'm not going to shrink back because it's difficult. And I feel like I, I went through that season. I passed those tests and I continued on and it was a slow, gra- gradual climb out. I remember many a times I would just go spend time away and just, just pray and be sitting at a park or whatever. And, you know, when God said, if you tell this mountain to move it to, to, go into the ocean and throw us off in the ocean at will. And I was doing that. I'm like, I've got all the faith in the world to believe it. And the mountain still wasn't throwing itself in the ocean. You know, it was just, but it was still trust. And I feel like I I passed the test. I learned God took me through that experience. And then, you know, when I was able to get a place to live again and start to build myself back up again, I started building those dreams up again. And I'm like, okay, God didn't put me through all of this to not come out on the other side stronger and better. What is God going to do? Let's go do it. Okay. Hold on. Hold on before you get any further. So that's where I want to get into next. So, and I've been taking notes as you've been talking. So the first thing that you talked about is you started taking spiritual gifts tests. Uh, You found your gifts, things you were good at, things you were bad at. That was kind of like step number one. Okay. Then you talked about, you said you felt like the Lord told you your gut that was like, I need to connect the body because it's broken. What did you do? So you kind of know what you're good at. You know some strengths. You know things you're not good at. You feel like God has said, I've called you to heal the body. Now you've been broken. Obviously, you're going through a hard time. At this point, what are you doing to obey the Lord as far as this is what I feel like I'm called to do? What are you doing about it? So immediately I go into visionary mode. I go into planning mode. I go into strategist mode. I'm I'm like, okay, what can I do about this? What's that going to look like? What should I do? You know, and I started figuring out plans and ways and ultimately through, you know, learning a lot about the internet. And this is, you know, 2005, 2006, internet's just starting, it's just blowing up and social media is just becoming a big thing. I mean, Facebook, I think was only founded right around that time. And, you know, MySpace was big and everything was just starting to blow up. And I realized, you know, I was like, I create a whole entire plan of how, you know, the body of Christ could just create, I could create some kind of resource where the body of Christ could go in and, you know, each part of the body of Christ, whether it be an individual, whether it be a ministry or a church could all, you know, have profiles and, and, you know, map out their connections and, and put the different ministries and stuff they work with and they follow and find different opportunities to connect, you know, both on local scales and global scales and, and just start finding ways to plug in within other parts of the body of Christ. And I'm like, okay, this, this 
technology, you know, if you put it out there, it could be something that could be used instead of social media being about what you're eating for breakfast. You know, it could it could be used in the same manner, you know, for the body of Christ to connect and, and show how it's interconnected and to be stronger together. And that was just kind of a first draft. So I, I went through and I planned it all out. I, I wrote out what the website would look like. I did everything that could be do. Problem was, I wasn't a website developer. I wasn't a coder. I didn't have the money to build it. So I'm like, okay, I've got all these plans out here. I've got it written out. I, I, I put a, what I probably, about a 45 page kind of document of, of the whole entire plan of how to make all this work. And if, and I was just like, I, I've got it all built out. I don't know where you want to go with it, God. So I started meeting with different people, different church leaders or different things. And it just never was right. See, they don't, the body of Christ, and it's smart. You don't necessarily want to put money into something that's not there. There's plenty of good quality things that the, the, the ministries and churches are doing that you could give into that actually is going to have a return on investment right away. Whereas this is something that's like, okay, it may work, it may not work. You know, we need to be good stewards of our money. Maybe it's not the right thing for us to put our money into. You know, getting rejected multiple times you know, was hard, but I had to just continue to trust God. So I would say that was almost a different sense of, of humbling. You know, you just couldn't make it work. And I just continued to go. I continued to, when I had spare time, you know, when I wasn't trying to also pay the bills, because, you know, I, I committed to my wife when our kids were born that I would let her stay home to take care of our kids and to homeschool our kids if that's what we chose. And, and I've never given up on that. And we've never given up on that. And it's always been something we will never regret doing. But it put a lot of pressure on me to make sure that I was still providing. So it's been a journey. So that was the next step that I took which ultimately has led me to continuing to grow as a person and ultimately led me to write my book, which in in itself is a little bit different path, but it all still points towards where God wanted me to go. Okay, let's go into your book. So some of my next questions are about your strengths and weaknesses and stuff like that. And and you can intertwine that maybe somehow within your book, but I do want to hear about Epic Christianity. What is it? Why did you write the book? Well, I actually, I did want to share my strengths because I, okay, I already yeah. prepared for that because I know a lot of times you talk about how people's strengths can also be their greatest weaknesses. And I, yes. and I figured that out for myself as well. And there's a couple of things that I think are, are my biggest strengths. One of them is I always forget what is behind and I press on towards what is ahead. You know, I don't carry the pain and regret of the past and I don't let it cripple me or carry it into my future. And I've always said to myself, you know, I strive to carry the wisdom and understanding that I gained through all those experiences without carrying the baggage of the pain, hurt, and resentment. And I think that that's one thing that's always helped me to move forward because so many times people experience, you know, something in their life, whether it be of their own fault or somebody else's fault or, or whatever. And it becomes so crippling in their life, whether it's a failure of their own, whether it's something somebody did to them or whatever, it's always been my, you know, my way of thinking in my head. And I think it's just a gift that God's given me is a, I can't change the past. I can only change now and I can only change the future. I didn't have a dad. People are like, well, you didn't have a dad. You know, how are you such a good dad? Because I choose to be a good dad. I don't care if I had a good dad or didn't have a good dad or didn't have a dad at all. You know, so I don't let something like that. You know, I had abuse growing up. I grew up, we grew up poor. I don't let any of those things affect me because I can live my life now. God has given me, you know, his spirit to do immeasurably more than anything I could ask or imagine. I have a a spirit of overcoming, a spirit of of being able to accomplish. I have the God of the universe living within me and I have a calling and plan in my life. Why do I care about what somebody else said, what somebody else did, or even my own inadequacies or mistakes that may have hurt me along the way? I can learn from them. I can take them. I can use them and I can move forward. And I love the fact that I have pain and hurt in my past because I can see how God can use that. And if I ever come across somebody like my book is to help people to build, you know, the life that God wants them to build, to build a plan to get there, to build the actions to get there, to really stay focused so that they can make the most of the one life that God has for them so they can live without regrets and come to the end of it, knowing that they they did it and that they're proud of what they accomplished and that God will one day say, well done, good and faithful servant. And, you know, when you're holding on to the past, you just won't get to that point. I love that I can tell anybody who says, well, you don't know what I've gone through, or you haven't experienced this, or, you know, you know, I'm from nothing. I have nothing to start with. I don't, you know, I, I can't do anything because I've been there. I've experienced that. I started with nothing. I would not want to do it any other way in retrospect because I can use that to help people. But that same strength of forgetting 
is also a weakness because I often forget the good things. I forget, you know, where am I going? What am I focusing on? What am I trying to accomplish? You know, just a week ago, I really said, I'm going to do this. And a week later, I completely forgot that I was going to do that. You know, it's like, I, not only do I forget the, the bad in the past, sometimes I forget the, the good that I wanted to build up. You know, I'm not carrying that weight of the past, but I'm also not carrying the good sometimes. So that's another reason why I wrote Epic Christianity, because my lack of focus, my lack of focusing on the important things and what I'm trying to accomplish and where I'm going and what I've learned, I wanted to create a plan to have those things written out somewhere and a way to review them often so that my, my brain and my mind, you know, could see those things. And those, you know, so that's how my strengths and weaknesses work. But going right into the book itself, my whole thought process with the book was, is I wanted to write something, you know, that I could give to my kids. And if I were to die next week, you know, I would know that this is setting them up for success. It's the best I know to help them to follow God and to make the most of the one life that God has given them. Because really when life comes down to it, you know, we're all created to bring God glory in this life and to use the gifts and abilities and experiences that we've experienced and that we've been given to make the most of it and to to make a difference and bring him glory. But how do you get there? And that's kind of what we talked about a lot already is how do you get there? So, you know, my book is broken up into seven days. And at the beginning, it's building your foundation. You've got to get, you know, over, over the past and the pain and the frustration. You've got to learn to take responsibility for your life. And you've got to realize that we reap what we sow and the choices that we make will determine the life that we live. And the first action step that I have along the way is to make a commitment, to make a commitment to yourself and to God to follow his way and his path and just write that out and then determine why is it that you want to make the most of your life and follow follow God. And I kind of go through a whole entire process where we move into finding your purpose, getting a vision for the future, you know, defining your top five goals and developing action steps or regular habits you can take to get there. And then just a few other things. And at the very end, you know, you will have built a plan, an action plan of, you know, staying focused and where you're going, you know, on being a grateful person on, you know, filling your, your mind and your heart with the right things. And you will have built the life, at least a picture of the life that you want to live. And that's what I did for myself. So now when I go to forget all those things, like I used to go to seminars and take coaching and do all these different things. And I'd write all kinds of things down in a journal and those things disappear in a journal. And I would go back and read a journal from five years ago and be like, man, that was a good idea. Oh man, I completely forgot to do that. Or I've really fallen back off right where I was before. Cause it's funny how, when we don't stay focused on something, even a commitment that we've made, there's almost like this mediocre level that just falls us right back to where we were. It's like, we have this just, just, just average line that we just fall right to. And even if we're not doing bad things, we just fall right back to just this average line. It, it's, a, it's a line where you, you're getting by, you're not doing anything bad. You're not doing anything that great. You're just getting by. And that's not where I want to be. Yeah, I, I, it's funny you say that when you talk about staying focused. I, that's something I've been having to do in my life as well. And I think a lot of people, it's so easy. If you don't have it in front of you and you don't have those goals that you're reaching towards, it's really easy to... I just wa- got done watching that movie Up with the house yeah. that floats away and the dogs, they go, squirrel! And then mm-hmm, and all of a sudden, yeah, and that's us. And, and it's so important. Well, I love what you talked about is have in your book is about having vision, finding your purpose, having vision, and then staying focused on that. Because uh, honestly, the enemy, that's one tactic that he uses is to come is to make us lose focus on the things that are important. Oh, for sure. And to person in that. So I'm, I'm really thankful that you brought that up. I want to ask you, Jamie, what is a personal daily habit that you feel like has contributed to staying focused in your walk with Jesus? Well, my habits have gotten a lot better since I, I wrote the book because one of my top five goals basically is to to be the best I can be and, and you know, live by God's standards. And I realized, you know, I need to take responsibility for my spiritual life. That's one of my, my main roles is my relationship with God is, a, is one of the biggest roles I have in life that I have to be responsible for. So along the way, I, I talk about how important it is to build habits. And I, so I wrote down habits for myself, like, okay, you know, if I'm going to make my relationship with God, you know, a priority, what kind of habits do I need to build in my life? And I realized even at a young age and back when God needed to humble the heck out of me, I guess, I didn't even pray every day, you know? So like, obviously, like I start out every day just praying on my knees to God. Sometimes it's, you know, only for 30 seconds. Sometimes it's for a few minutes, but it's just a matter of starting out my day saying, you know, being grateful, you know, asking for God's help, you know, committing myself to him. And, you know, I wrote out a commitment to God and I pretty much kind of know the things that are in there. But I've learned that when I start out the day praying and committing myself to him and asking for, you know, him to, to show up in my life. And I was asking him to open my eyes so that I could see and I asked him to 
you know, just, just help me and be with me and lead and guide me. And, and I always commit to abstain from willful sin. I would say probably one of the biggest habits I have in my own relationship with God is not just the habit of praying and making sure I read some Bible and being a thankful person and, and, a, and things like that. It's actually the habit of saying no to temptation. I made that actually a habit. Like it's a, it's a, it's a choice that I make every single day. I want to say no to the temptation that comes my way. And when I say the temptation, I'm talking about like willful sin. You know, we all struggle with different things, but there are certain things that when you're tempted with it, you either have a choice to say yes or say no. And when I start to fall off and when I start to just feel like I'm just frustrated or I lose focus on what I'm doing or I just kind of get idle, like I just don't really have anything I'm working on right this second or I'm just kind of tired, I start to be willing to give in to the temptations that'll come my way. You know, I mean, if if something were to come on the computer that's going to lead me down a, a wrong path, you know, there was a time when it was like, well, you know, I'm kind of giving up. You know, and you'll just kind of give up and you'll look at something you shouldn't be looking at or doing something. Everybody's temptations are different. Everybody struggles with different things. I mean, people have a different addictions. People have different struggles. But I've made a choice. It's a daily habit. I made a choice. I'm, you know what? I'm going to say no. And my reason why is God has a great plan for me. I'm trying to accomplish great things with my life. And I need his hand of favor and blessing to be on me. And I need him to protect me. And I feel like sometimes whenever we give in to junk in our lives, it's almost like God takes his hand of protection off in a little area. And sometimes the devil can kind of sneak in, get that stronghold and, you know, all that you've, you've been working to, to do and accomplish in every area of your life to be the best you can be, you start to fall short. So I would say that, you know, just really committing myself to, to say no to those temptations that come my way is probably one of the most important habits besides just, just normal spiritual disciplines. Yeah, absolutely. What is a resource that you would like to share with our listeners? Well, obviously, I mean, if anybody, you know, is looking for a path you know, to be able to build the most of their life, you know, my book is, is big. Um, I know you normally ask people about, you know, what books that they, they might have read. And I've actually read my book 10 times in the last year and a half just because I have to do so much with it to fix it and make it better and, and then to implement it in my own life. But along the way, books that have also helped me along the way is The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. Yes. Great, great book. And it, it's really been influential to me. Also, another book that's a lot lighter read, but for people that feel like God has given them a dream, it's called Dream Giver by Bruce Wilkinson. Those two books have probably had you know some of the greatest impact on my life, apart from the Bible, because I think that when we supplement the Bible with other things, it's fine. But when we, we neglect the Bible for other things, it hurts us. I've, I've found that sometimes... I don't know what I want to read in the Bible, but I found that there's a there's a supernatural power that fills the Holy Spirit and just gives you more strength when you're you're letting the word of God get in you even if you know it's not even making sense. Even if you're not sure you know, where you should read. There's just something about every day that that word of God getting in you that just makes you stronger. And I think it just unleashes God's power in your life. Absolutely. All right, Jamie, I want to ask you this question. I ask it for everybody, no matter time frame, and we are getting down to uh, wrapping things up. But I want to ask you this. If you got to go back to the younger you, what age would you go to? And what advice would you give yourself? You can't change anything in the future. You're not going to be able to change anything except give you yourself the advice knowing what you're going to go through. Well, I would obviously go back to an age where I could actually really make a difference for my whole life. So I'd go back to like 18 to 20, where I'm old enough to understand what I'm going to say, but not, you know, too old where I've already started to get set in some, some stuff. But one thing I would tell myself is to stop procrastinating and always to put my first and best effort into the things that are actually most important. And I, I found that I was I was just immature, lazy, and I would always procrastinate. If I had something to do, I mean, I wrote, I finished writing an English senior project. I woke up at like three o'clock in the morning of the day it was due, walked into class with five minutes left to go in that class just to get it in on time because I was that kind of procrastinator. If, you know, I've, but I learned along the way, when you start putting you know, your first and best effort into the things that are actually most important and you do those things first and not try to do all the urgent things or all the not important things first and save the important things for last, you start building a life that's important to you. And so I would make sure that, hey, if it's important, if it's something you need to accomplish, put it first and stop being that procrastinator. And one other thing that I would say, that was more on a personal level. The other thing I would tell myself is to not criticize others or talk down about others because it not only hurts them, but it also hurts myself. And I don't, I don't know what it is about humanity. We just love to judge others and talk bad about others. And it's like when we pull others down, it makes us feel better about ourselves. And we can always find something to bring others down by. And I don't know why that was, I don't know if it was just influences or just humanity, but it was just normal to just want to bring somebody down. And I've changed that, you know, so I, I wouldn't do that anymore. I would, you know, always try to find the positive I can bring out in others. 
That's a powerful statement you just made. And as we're wrapping things up, I actually preached on that this last week. And uh, I asked the congregation, I said, do you mind if I get in your business for a minute? And uh, I could see the look on my wife's face like, oh, crap, what is he about to say? And I basically made this is what I said. When we are talking bad about others or dealing with jealousy or envy or all those things that we all deal with, it doesn't matter Christian or not, we all deal with those things. And what I said was, is when you're dealing with those things, it's like the gauge in your truck going off the dashboard to let you know that you have engine problems. And the reason you're having a problem is, is because you're not walking your path. And we're walking the path that God has for us. And we're finding fulfillment and joy and peace and all those things because we're fulfilling our purpose. Then we start finding joy in seeing other people fulfill their purpose. And, and Certainly. I, yeah. And I think when we walk the path that we were created for, we don't fall into that temptation of uh, being judgmental. So anyways, I agree. Side note, Jamie, please share with us where we can find you people that a lot of our listeners need your book, whether they found purpose or not. I know it's going to be inspirational writing vision and those things. So how do we find your book and how do we contact you? Uh, simple. Just go to epicchristianity.com or there's also, I just released the Epic Christianity podcast. So either one of those places are a great way to get connected. Okay. Epic Christianity podcast is you're an iTunes stitcher and that stuff. Yeah. And actually at the time this recording just came out, I don't even know that it shows up on the rankings yet. It just came out last week and it's in there and yeah. Okay. Awesome. Jamie, what is one last piece of parting advice you would like to leave our audience as we launch out today? I wasn't prepared for that, but just going on the same path that we were just talking about, you know, be you, you know, live, live your best life. Don't compare yourself to others. You know, don't try to be somebody else. Don't make yourself feel better by putting others down. But when you can find out who you are, how you're created, what God wants to accomplish through your life, and you take responsibility for that, you know, there's there's no limit to what you can do and you'll make the difference in the world that God created you to be. So just go be your best you. That's all I'd say. Awesome. Amen to that. Jamie, hold on just a second. Roar Nation, thank you so much for jumping on today. It was a pleasure getting to interview Jamie. I hope you feel inspired, uplifted. Please check out his book in Amazon and check out his new podcast. Again, you can go on our site, areyoureal.org, and you can listen to his and many others who have found purpose. Type in his name. He will be on our front page. And thank you so much for taking the time to rate and review us. Please do it again. Come on our front page. We have an email list. We should be launching our book soon. I've said that several episodes, but we are just getting down to final drafts. And I just okayed the book cover. So we are getting close. But thank you, everyone. We love you. And remember, be real, be authentic, and be you. God bless. That's all for this episode of Are You Real? Finding the Authentic You. Be sure to go to areyoureal.org for your free questionnaire to identify your gifts and talents and how you can use them to help people become leaders and catapult them into their destiny to help others become the leaders of tomorrow. We appreciate you spending your time with us and look forward to helping you reach out and revolutionize next time on Are You Real? Finding the Authentic You. Oh, 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 oh,